I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to talk about my thesis work, which I'm in the process of wrapping up in the Kierkegaard lab. And the basic question we were asking with this work is, can a single antiviral, can you target it so that it simultaneously inhibits the growth of the virus and prevents the outgrowth of drug resistance? So I'm going to be talking about positive strand RNA viruses, but we think our strategy would actually apply even beyond them. So drug resistance is really this intuitive process of mutation and selection. So a virus infects a cell and starts error-prone replication of its genome. And just by chance, one of those progeny happens to be drug resistant. So when you add the drug, you end up inhibiting everything except for that resistant variant. And so it spreads, it amplifies, and basically you render your drug useless in a very short amount of time. So multi-drug therapy, we know, is a great way to prevent this from happening. But the viruses that we work with, there are no antivirals, let alone multiple. Um, so this includes dengue virus and polio virus, which is what I work on. And for those, it seems like monotherapy would actually be the most expedient way to start curing infections. So the way we think you can do this hinges on this moment after the drug-resistant variant arises. So we're not going to prevent that from happening. We're seeding that ground to the virus. But the important thing is that resistant variant is vastly outnumbered by these susceptible variants. And they're all expressing their proteins in the cytoplasm, and they have the potential to interact. So what if you target a protein that, as part of its function, has to form an oligomeric complex? So something like the capsid. Because then you can imagine proteins from the drug-resistant variant end up stuck in these structures with drug-inhibited, drug-susceptible drug proteins. And overall, it's very likely that these structures will have a drug-inhibited phenotype, so neither the susceptible variant nor the resistant variant will be able to escape this cell. So if you love genetic terms the way I do, this is akin to a dominant negative interaction. And in fact, that's why we call this strategy dominant drug targets. And I know the idea is a bit abstract. So it helps to get more concrete and actually talk about the capsid, which I mentioned. So this is the glorious poliovirus capsid. There are four different viral proteins in here, and there's 60 copies of each of them. So it's a highly oligomeric assemblage, exactly what we wanted to target. And we were lucky because we could use this compound shown in orange called VO73. And it tucks into this hydrophobic pocket in the capsid and rigidifies the structure. And for a variant of function, its capsid needs to be able to breathe in order to attach to a cell and release the genome. And so now we can kind of start mechanistically understanding how dominant drug targets might work. Because you can imagine you could get a virus that has this capsid that's chimeric. So it has drug susceptible and drug resistant subunits within it. And wherever you have that susceptible protein, the VO73 compound can still inhibit. And it's likely that overall this structure has a drug inhibited phenotype, despite the presence of the drug resistant subunits. So I've actually demonstrated that these chimeric capsids form. Um, you can see that on my poster. But the much more interesting question, I think, is so even if these form, does that mean the susceptible virus variants are dominant to the resistant ones and suppress its growth? So to do that, we wanted to use an assay where we were mimicking when that resistant variant first arises in a cell with all those susceptible ones. So I just selected for a drug-resistant variant and co-infected it with susceptible virus in the presence of the capsid inhibitor. And then I titered the yield of the resistant virus to see if the susceptible virus could inhibit its growth. So I'm going to show you the capsid inhibitor data, but I will also always show you data like this. Oop, my labels got a little messed up here. But um, what we're looking at is guanidine, low concentra concentrations of guanidine inhibit this 2C protein. It's not too important what exactly that's doing for this talk. It's just important that we knew that resistant variants would be uninhibited by the presence of susceptible virus. And you can see that at this co-infection. So the MOI of the guanidine resistant variant should say that it's at an MOI of 10. <laughs> um, and, and you can see as I add in increasing amounts of drug susceptible virus, the yield of the resistant variant is uninhibited. That's not too surprising. What was surprising is here's the capsid inhibitor data. And you can see, as I add in more and more drug-susceptible virus, I dramatically inhibit the growth of the resistant variant. 
So I want to point out, this is a log scale. So this is serious inhibition. Even at just a 5 to 1 ratio, I have a 98% inhibition in the yield of the resistant variant. So this data made us feel confident in saying we'd identified our first real dominant drug target, the capsid. And what we're presuming is we're seeing this inhibition because the susceptible virus is in the same cell as the resistant variant, which of course will naturally happen in an infection like I showed you in the beginning. But we could actually test that requirement more explicitly. And this takes me a second to explain, but this is literally my favorite piece of data ever. So I want to take the time to do it. So if I have a stock of wild-type poliovirus in the lab, it's really incredibly heterogeneous. So there's already drug-resistant variants pre-existing in that stock. So if I take the stock and I infect at a low MOI, let's say one, the resistant variants get into cells by themselves. So if I'm talking about a non-dominant drug target or a dominant drug target, in the presence of the drug, those variants will grow out of the infection. But now if I take this stock and I infect at a high MOI, for a non-dominant drug target, it doesn't matter. These resistant variants will still grow out. But for a dominant drug target, these susceptible variants are now in the cell with the resistant one, and they should inhibit its growth. So I should see a difference at a high MOI. So these are literally my titering plates. <laughs> this is a plaque assay. This is all done at the same dilution. And what you can see when I use guanidine to inhibit the non-dominant drug target, I get increasing amounts of guanidine-resistant virus as I increase the MOI. So even at, you know, at this MOI of 100, basically, there are no cells left to stain on the plate because they've all been lysed by virus. But for the capsid inhibitor, I see drug-resistant virus plaques at an MOI of 1 and even 10, but they all but disappear at an MOI of 100. And in this case, I added 100 times more VO73 resistant variants than I did at an MOI of 1, and I still get less virus out of that infection than at an MOI of 1. So this made us very confident that the reason VO73 resistant variants can grow is specifically because susceptible variants are in the same cell as them. And I also like this because this just serves as a screen for dominant drug targets. You don't even have to know what an inhibitor is targeting. You just have to see if you get this MOI-dependent emergence of drug resistance. So all of this really just begs the question, what's going to happen in a real infection? All of this has been in tissue culture over a single infectious cycle. Well, the idea is actually not very different at all, because it's just that in a natural infection, or in our case, we'll be infecting transgenic mice with poliovirus, you expect that resistant variants will arise. They'll just arise many times throughout the course of infection, but they will always be accompanied by the drug-susceptible cousins in the same cell. So in this case, we're not infecting with drug-resistant virus. In this case, we're just allowing it to arise naturally. So that means, and I want to be really clear about this because this is usually the most confusing point, we don't require MO high MOI infections for this idea to work. I use high MOIs in cell culture to mimic this situation when the resistant variant arises, but we don't need high MOIs in the actual mouse model. So here's that data. So what we're looking at on the top here, this is just the total viral yield in the mouse muscles. Um, and we've been intramuscularly infected the mice, and then we treat either with guanidine in purple or with VO73. And you can see that both drugs actually inhibit the growth of the virus compared to controls. So we know there's selective pressure on these virus populations. The question is, does that cause drug resistance to emerge? So at just four days post-infection, you can see for guanidine, there's a significant increase in the frequency of guanidine-resistant virus. But on day four, five, and even out to seven days post-infection, we never see an increase in the frequency of VO73 resistant variants. So from this, we conclude that targeting the capsid inhibitor suppresses the emergence of drug-resistant virus up to a week of infection. We can't really go past then because the mice die. Um, but so this was our first example of not only a dominant drug target, which is the capsid, but that dominant drug targets will actually act to suppress the emergence of drug resistance using a single drug. So with that, I'm going to very briefly conclude that what I showed you is inhibiting the capsid, which is an oligomeric assemblage, prevents the outgrowth of drug resistance both in cell culture and in the mouse model. And we in no way think that this is specific to poliovirus or just the capsid. Um, so 
I'm good. <laughs> so we're working on other targets. Um, for example, an intramolecularly cleaving protease and the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and those are much more complicated to think about. Um, but if you want to talk about things like that, I have a poster, and my lab mate, Nick Van Buren, also has a poster. Um, and other people in the lab work on other viruses uh, with this idea, dengue virus and hepatitis C. Um, and I've also become incredibly interested in how the virus actually is spreading, because it's possible that that is contributing to the success of dominant drug targets. So. With that, I would just like to acknowledge my advisor, Carla Kierkegaard, who is really amazing to work for, um, but she also actually did a lot of the mouse work herself. We were kind of switched off who had to go in at 2 a.m. to dose the mice. So it's pretty impressive, I think. So thank you. It was really nice work. Uh, the compound that you're, you're using, the V073, the, is this the bleconerol analog? Yeah, it's currently in clinical development for polio. Have yeah. you seen any of the clinical data with, with that compound? I think uh, Mark and his uh, colleagues were testing it in, in uh, polio vaccine, right, in patients? Yeah, so yeah, it suppresses it, the patient. growth of the virus, yeah. So I was wondering if there's anything known about the cell biology of capsid assembly. So you have these different viral genomes, and your model is that they're all mixing. Mm -hmm. But it's also possible that there are local virus replication factories in which you might have a local concentration of the resistant capsid variant. So it would be important to know something about that. Have, have there been studies? I've done studies. So <laughs> I mean, there have been studies. So what made us think this was possible is back in the 60s, they did co-infections of cells with type 1 and type 2 poliovirus. And they saw that uh, they, they used neutralizing antibodies and saw that really either one worked on almost 100% of the population. So it seemed like capsids were really mixing. But I also, I tagged the capsid. Um, I tagged it with a flag tag and an HA tag. And I, would, I could pull down with the flag tag, and you can see HA tagged uh, protein in there. And I should say, because I can, uh, that when I did that, I actually pulled down infectious virions so I could test whether those capsids were drug resistant. And even at just a one to one ratio of drug resistant to drug susceptible virus, about 40% of the capsids that I pulled down were drug susceptible, even though what I pulled down uh, was the one that, the resistant variant was the one that I pulled down. 